I got up, I did cardio, shovel, all the good shit. Oh, oh, oh. oh man, this is my old school music, yo. <laughs> Hello, my name is Maria Perez. I am from San Antonio, Texas. 34 years ago, I was a victim of human trafficking. Hello, I'm Brian Shree from Texas. As a previous probation parole officer who supervised the most violent and repeated sex offenders in Florida and in Texas, human trafficking continues to this day as one of the most heinous crimes of modern day society. I'm Kimberly Trapani, all consuming film. Right now, traffics are robbing a staggering 24.9 million people of their freedom and basic human dignity. That's roughly three <coughs> times the population of New York City. Let's go with it. <laughs> uh, got my dog here chilling by my feet. Nice. So if anybody hears rattling or anything, it's just my pup. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Yeah, my pups are passed out. <clears throat> Hello, y'all. Welcome up, back Katie? to Saturday. We are live at All Consuming Filming, and we have amazing, wonderful guests. I'm not going to introduce these guests mm -hmm. in any order of importance. They're both equally as amazing, uh, but I've known Luca Brasi the longest, and Luca and I have worked together with personal training. He's responsible for my health and wellness and has gotten me through a lot of pinches and also, we have Tony Latore, who served our country in the military. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for joining us on a Saturday. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Kim. And I just want to—I want to just correct one little thing. Uh, Tony is far more important than I am. I no, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep it modest, you know. <laughs> Stay humble. Yes, I asked you both on, but in in the time of uh, Lucas from Schenectady, Tony, tell us where you're from. A uh, small little town called Broome, New York. Um, I actually did a little research the other day, and, and there's 900 people in the whole entire town. So, yeah, I've no, I, I haven't heard of Broome. I think it's down by Kingston or someplace. Is that where? Well, uh, that's Broome County, so big difference. Uh, Town of Broome is literally a couple mountains, a few dirt roads, and a whole lot of cattle. There's more cattle than there is people, so it's perfect. Yeah, that's amazing. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself, Tony, since you serve the country and you're, Lucas says you're more important? <laughs> oh, I love him. I love him. Uh, yeah, so, oh, man, uh, long story short, I did fire an EMS for – uh, I'm going on my 17th year now. Um, served in the Army, 10th Mountain Division. Uh, got all fun stuff like that. Got hurt. They booed me out for getting hurt. So fortunately, unfortunately, uh, but everything happens for a reason. Uh, now I run a podcast to help veterans and first responders um, talk about the hard stuff that we really don't talk about because we are told, you know, early in life, especially as males, you know, don't talk about your feelings. Well, I'm breaking that stigma and saying, no, you need to talk about those feelings. Uh, me and myself. I've had, uh, I do have PTSD, anxiety, depression, all that fun stuff that came with the first responder and the military world. So we go out and we try to help and, and support other veteran networks and communities and first responders first and foremost, but we like to help anyone we can um, overall. And I'm going to school 
uh, for my second degree in business. So that's fun. Um, and yeah, married kids. <coughs> so good time. That's awesome. And yeah, we are so excited to have you. My grandfather was a colonel and that's why I appreciate it. And you serving the country and Luca who had tones my body, not only for film, but so that the older I get, I feel so I feel good. He's he's uh, introduced me to you. <laughs> but can you tell me a little bit, Luca, how how did you meet Tony? Uh, Tony and I actually, we initially met, well, I feel like we told this story a lot of times, but not on this platform. So uh, we met in 2014 and it was uh, around the time when I was doing a lot of shows around the Capital District and I was selling a lot of them out. The majority of the, I, we, did, we did several shows, we sold them all out. We were beyond fire code for a couple of them. Um, so we actually <laughs> almost got in trouble a couple of times, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> my one of my ex-girlfriends from when I was a teenager, I one of the ones that I still talk to and communicate with, her mother got a hold of me. Uh, her name was Missy. And she says, hey, you know, she's like, me and my husband, she's like, we have a, we own a bar now. She was like, we've been, and I heard about, you know, everything you've been doing around this area. Would you want to come and do a show here? So I was like, yeah, sure. So I was like, let me come and check the place out. So I went and I looked at it and we set a date and the date happened to coincide. It was three days before my album was about to be released. I even remember the date. It was March 22nd was the show um, yeah. in 2014. And it was right before <clears throat> my album was going to come out. And so I said to Missy, I was like, why don't we make it an album release party? She's like, yeah, that sounds great. She goes, now, do you have a regular DJ? She was like, that you use. If not, we have an in-house DJ. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, who's the in-house DJ? And she says... DJ LaRocco. <laughs> and I said, okay, I was like, well, I was like, I never heard of him yet. I was like, but let me meet him. <clears throat> I was like, and let's see. As soon as we met, we just kind of clicked. Like we met, we set up a meeting for about a week later at the bar. We met there and then we just kind of, we could almost finish each other's thoughts. Like we kind of knew where we wanted to go with the show, what we wanted to do. And we just kind of bonded just through the, the fact that he was a DJ, I'm an MC. Uh, excuse me, is a DJ and I'm an MC and we do all these different things in music. And that's kind of how it all got started. And then at first it was just like, yeah, he's a cool guy. He's a good, he's a good DJ. I was like, you know, I could definitely see myself being friends with them too. Now here we are almost 10 years later and we're like family, <laughs> you know? So it's kind of the roads we take and the people we meet, you know, there's a lot of twists and turns, man. But every once in a while you find a couple of really good people, you know what I mean? That you can really, really, not only bond with, but you can kind of be creative together and get your ideas flowing. We're working on two or three different things right now, <laughs> you know, the two of us together. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much how it all started. <clears throat> that's awesome. And um, in light of today being the memorial for in your town, the missing child becoming <laughs> a homicide, I just want to get your thoughts, um, it, what words of advice, I promised Samantha Humphrey's mother that I would do a shout out, what advice would you have uh, in no order of importance, Tony or Luca, for people who have, you have children, Tony, for <clears throat> Grieving parents of lost children, if you could just give me some words of advice on um, giving, um, being kind or words of advice, Tony or Luca can go first. Go ahead, Tony. You go first. Buddy. Um, the one yeah, the kids. first. I, I couldn't imagine being in that position. I won't want to be in that position by any means. Um, so it's kind of hard to say, hey, you should do this. You shouldn't do that because I'm not there. But I would say. You know, first and foremost, keep the faith, whatever faith or beliefs you have. Stay strong with that. Um, stay connected with people. Don't distance yourself. Because um, I know how darkness can be really, really horrible because um, I've been there before um, and almost took my own life because of it. So I, I definitely understand that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say take a tragedy and turn it into something good, kind of like what I do with the podcast. You know, raise awareness um, if she could to other people about these situations um, use your story to empower and help other people because 
kind of like Luke said, you know, you go down certain roads, you meet certain people, but also you go down certain roads and you have situations in your life where absolutely suck. And you're like, why am I going through this? Well, it sucks, but it's that strength that you have to find to get through it and then learn from it and teach others not to go down that road or wherever. In this situation, I would just say, have her just try to reach out and tell her story to people um, because it is important to know and it's important to raise awareness. Luca, yeah. you wrote a book. You're an author. What would you tell people in your books? Yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, the loss of a child isn't something that I specifically covered in my book or anything, but I'm not trying to plug my book, but the name of the book was 20 Reasons and 20 Ways to Diminish Self-Doubt. There are, <clears throat> I think, a lot of things probably in that book that could help someone who goes through that kind of, you know, at least start a recovery process. Because when things like that happen, I mean, that's an extreme thing. You know what I mean? I mean, they say that I think divorce is the second worst thing after um, after death. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The loss of a child or something like that. So, I mean, it's but like Tony said, there's a lot of ways that you can create something positive out of it. Like I know I don't know personally anyone who has done this, but like I've seen you know, on television and stuff and, 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 you know, all over the internet, these people who go through a tragedy like that, they lose a child and they become community organizers and they become advocates for like certain things, you know what I mean? And it's like when they lose a child, they, a lot of people I know they start, um, what do they call those? Uh, uh, I can't think of the word, but they start organizations based on, you know, the law. Yes. Yeah. Not for profit, those types of things in response to a loss that they went through, you know what I mean? And they go and they try to help other people, you know, who might be going through the same thing. They start these organizations to help people for those exact purposes that they themselves have gone through. And that's the type of thing that you, in order to understand it, you really, that is something you actually do have to go through to really understand it. Um, I don't believe, I, I don't like in a lot of cases when someone says, if you haven't experienced then don't say anything, because I don't necessarily think that's true in all cases. This is one of those cases I think it is. But for example, a case where it's not is I don't think that a heart surgeon has to go through heart surgery to be a good heart surgeon. I don't think that an attorney has to go out and commit crimes in order to become a good attorney. You understand what I'm saying? There are certain situations. So in those particular cases, I don't think that's that's true. But in something like that, I think the only people who can really do something about it are the people who they sell them. They themselves have been through it. You know what I mean? And so it's, I couldn't imagine, I don't have children. Um, I can't even imagine losing my dog, <laughs> you know? So I can't imagine what it would be like to actually lose a child. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I just wanted to get into that before Tony, can you tell us what the worst part of the army was and, and what you learned from it? Um, the worst part for me, um, the training and all that stuff. Once you understand it, it's it's a game, it's a war, it's a job. You have certain duties and details, but it's a game. And if you know how to play a game and figure the game out quick, it's pretty easy to win. Show up on time in the right uniform and try your hardest. Do the best you can, um, and realize you're always going to fail. No matter what you do, you're going to fail. So once you accept that, like you're never going to be good enough. You're never, you know. Once you accept that part, it's it's decent. Uh, but the hardest part for me. Um, without getting too deep into it. Um, I was supposed to be deployed, taking all the training classes and all that fun stuff. Uh, they were going to split our unit to uh, Bogdan and Kandahar, which are kind of two separate areas um, in Afghanistan. And uh, yeah. two weeks before, we were doing a normal Monday morning run, and I tripped in a hole, in a pothole, um, which I've gone past thousands of times. Uh, in Afghanistan? You, no, no, in, in up in Fort Drum. Okay. Um, and I blew my knee out. So I wasn't able to go on deployment. They ended up, that's when they ended up booting me uh, for medical discharge. And the hardest part of that was one, I couldn't be there with my brothers and sisters. But then I found out afterwards that they were, um, I forgot what the words, rerouted pretty much to Kabul. And when they were launching all those rockets randomly and stuff, half my platoon got hit and died. So only wow. half of them came back over. That's awful. Yeah. And I was supposed to be there. You know, it was, again, a freak accident that I'm sure if I was looking better or something like that, I probably could avoid, but I was just doing my normal run mm -hmm. and tripped in the hole and mm -hmm. that was it. So, you know, I think that was the worst part was knowing people, gaining friends, because they become your family because you're literally with them 18, 20 hours a day, sometimes for month on end with training. Um, so 
having that family and knowing what's going on, knowing I should have been there and then not, not having them come back was the hardest. Some of them did, but most of them did. That um, doesn't, your story doesn't compare. I always say I learned crisis management on the job when, during 911, when I was a travel agent that day, but your story is much worse. What'd you learn from the army? I learned a lot. One of the biggest things I learned was there's so many people in the, in the army. It's like one big crock pot, as everyone knows. You don't get to choose who your, I'll say, teammates are. You don't get to choose your squad. So you have different walks of life. I was in at 30 years old, coming from upstate New York in the country. And now I have kids from Hawaii, Guam, uh, all, all sorts of a cesspool of, of different people, ages, races, everything. So that part was crazy because it's like, you don't know who you're going to be with and you have to make it work. You don't have a choice. It's like, Oh, I don't like that person. I don't want to do this work. I'm going to do something else. No, you don't have a choice. So you make it work. You figure out, you know, at that time you're there for a job, you do what your job is. You don't have to go hang out and have a beer with them after, you know, you're there to do a work, figure it out quick and move on. What we call Charlie Mike continue mission, Charlie Mike, just get your stuff done and go on. So. Luca, do you want to add to knowing Tony? Did you know Tony when he was training or um, much later? Yeah, yes, I did. Because uh, you, yeah, Tony, correct me if I'm wrong. That was after we met, right? That's when you decided yeah. to go into the 2017. Army, the Army route. Yeah, that's what I figured. So, yeah, I knew Tony fairly well at the time. There was a period of time for a couple of years there where we still kept in touch a little bit. Yeah. Um, But, you know, we were both we were both going through a lot of different things and probably 20 the end of 2016 all the way up through around the time COVID hit in 2019 we still were in touch but we didn't keep in touch as much as we obviously do now we talk at least every other day pretty much we text or whatever even if it's just a check-in um so yeah i didn't know him at that point um i actually didn't know about the injury or any of that i knew he was in the army i knew he decided to go go into the army but i didn't know really about the end injury or anything until a while after it happened uh when he, you were already discharged by the time i found out about it um yeah. so yeah i didn't really know the details of what happened at the time but i did know him yes at that time i did yeah <laughs> and how has tony changed a character from going enlisting in in the army and having to go through tripping over a pothole to avoid death uh how, how what kind of characteristics have you witnessed for growth for him no well i mean he's just a total jerk now so <laughs> <laughs> <Boy. laughs> no tony tony is is honestly one of the one of the best guys i know he's my best friend and the thing is, is we've gone, we've both gone through experiences, I think, over the last four or five years that have really humbled us mm -hmm. a lot. Not that we were egotistical, you know, jerks before that or anything like that. But I think we had a lot of life lessons over the last four or five years, both of us, where yeah. we're like, we understand certain things a lot better now. So I think that Tony, we both matured, you know, a lot. Uh, in some ways, we're very different. But in a lot of ways, we're exactly the same guys we were back in 2014. Like we get together and uh, a girl that I dated recently, I'm not going to say names here. You both know who I'm talking about, okay. but a girl that I did that I most recently dated mm -hmm. said to me, actually, not Tony, I don't think I told you this. She was like, you know, she's like, you and Tony, she's like, you guys remind me of like Batman and Robin. <laughs> and I go, well, who's Batman and who's Robin? She's like, it don't matter. She was like, you, you guys just have like that kind of connection. She's like, you're just like, he's your sidekick, you're his sidekick. And you know, the beautiful part about it too is, there is no leader between the two of us. And the reason why I say that, and Tony, I don't know if you noticed this, but like when we did the book, the book deal, okay. The book signing, mm -hmm. like that was my, my gimmick. Like that was something that I put together that I want to organize. I asked you to speak at it. I took the lead on that. However, when it came to the show, the, the last little gig that we most recently did, you booked it. You were the DJ. I was just there to do a couple live numbers and you had the lead on that. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. it depends on the situation as to who kind of takes the lead on what, but we never get in each other's way, stop on each other's toes, or I don't even think we've ever raised our voices at each other for anything. I don't think we've wow. ever really had much of a disagreement 
And the only, the only one other case that I've heard of that, and that's Elton John and his writer, that they have never once argued in their lives. And that's the only other team that I know that has actually been able to work that well together. Um, so to answer your question, Tony's matured a lot. He, <laughs> you know, he, he's he, he's a lot. He's very humble. He, he wasn't like, like I said, there was no big ego back then. But you know what I'm saying, Tony. Like we both mature and we both grown up and we both become a little bit more humble towards certain things. And uh, mm -hmm. I think on a universal level, I think Tony has become a better man overall since, since the injury, since everything and getting away from that last one you were with, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's definitely done nothing but on, only good things, man. And I've, I've never seen Tony as happy as he is now. We've never been better friends, you know, mm -hmm. every, every single day. I feel like our friendship gets better and better, you know. Which leads me into the fact that I'm not going to take a commercial break because I have a double show and um, I'm selfish and uh, we have always <laughs> coming up later. And you have a pro project tonight coming up. Can you tell me about that? Me or What's Tony? What's going on tonight? <laughs> Which Wait, one? Me or, me or Tony? <laughs> Either one of you. Who wants all right, well, to chime in here? All right, well, I mean, I'll go first. Yeah, tonight, pardon me, tonight, I actually didn't have a whole lot going on, It's that's which is actually unusual for me. I already worked out today and did everything. We have a lot of snow here, so my morning appointment's canceled. I'm Obviously, I'm a personal trainer, so we already know that. Um, so my appointment's canceled this morning. So I got up, worked out, shoveled the snow, did some tax stuff. I got it. It's tax season, so I started putting my taxes together. But tonight... <laughs> I'm probably just going to kick back and relax because the next few weekends in a row are going to be extremely busy. And not to mention, I work all week. I have appointments all throughout the week. Kim, you know this. Tony, you know this. So I'm usually pretty, pretty busy. So I try to sneak in naps where I can, you know, because I've always got something going on. So tonight I'm going to be kicking back with my dog. You're going to be kicking back. Okay. <laughs> I thought you had something going on with that DJ stint. Um <laughs> <laughs> No, not, no tonight. Not, not, not tonight. Oh, not tonight. <laughs> not tonight. Okay. T tell me about your DJing, Tony. Yeah. So I used to DJ, you know, like Luke said, we, way back in the day, we did tons of shows together, stuff like that. And it was just to have fun and make a little extra money. I kind of retired it. I sold all my stuff. Obviously went to the military. I sold almost everything in my life. Before I was in the military, I was actually homeless. Um, so I got rid of everything. And I got back into it saying, you know, let's make some extra money. I think I can get back into it. I mean, Luke, we're kind of kidding around one day. And, oh, yeah, we can go back into the scene. You know, now we're the old guys. You know, we went from doing rave shows to book signings and writing scripts for TV shows. Um, so I'm like, yeah, let's get back into it. And uh, I got back into it. So I'm doing it. Um, now it's money making. <clears throat> Now it's, you're going to pay my price because I know what my value is and I know my worth and I'm not going to screw you over either. Like I, I charge a hundred an hour, but for most DJs, you're talking 150, 200. Most of them are trying to get. So nah, bro, bro, it's closer to 400 now. I want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. They're charging crazy prices now, man. Crazy. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, and they, and they don't interact with the crowds. They're not very, most of them, some of them are, but most of them are just, you know, they're there, pick a dollar and that's it and do their thing. Um, so I've been DJing things like karaoke. I've been doing karaoke parties. Um, which I've, are I've, fun, which are fun. Come out and come to them, man. They're awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> How come I never get invited to these karaoke parties? Oh, I've been out for it. Just kidding. It's going to be fun. Um, but yeah, I've been doing uh, this place called The Grapevine out in Cobleskill, New York. We're doing a boozy bingo party. So in the mornings, 9 to 11, I got booked three shows now on my calendar. We got booked where they play bingo. Has some drinks and it's very fast paced. So um, yeah. you know, B eleven, B one, you know all that. And then in between each game, we play a little music, call it a day. Uh, I've been doing birthday parties, weddings, whatever you want. Um, so it's it's been good. It's been good. It's fun and interactive. So, tell me about you have some, if you can talk about this upcoming movies you're getting ready for. What's the title and what are you doing? You want to go, Tone, or you want me to go? That's all you, brother. That's all me. All right. Well, um, it, well, I know which one you're getting to, but most recently, I was I did a little short with Sean Ubley, uh that got premiered out in Rome at the Rome Capital Theater called uh, Deadly Shore, where I actually played the the lead character Silas Shore, uh, which was a lot of fun. So we start. We only shot the beginning of it and premiered that at the little short film festival they did. But he said. 
afterwards, which I didn't even know that it's going to be a feature length film. And I was like, oh, I was like, so I'm going to have to come back for this. And he was like, yeah, he was like, there's a whole movie. This was just the opening scene. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so there's that. That's still in the works. I haven't heard when we're going to be filmed again. But Kim, what you're talking about is the Hickmans. Okay. The Hickman script that we're working on. And the way that whole thing came about is uh, Tony a few months back was nice enough to invite me to Atlantic city. <clears throat> and when he first invited that. me, there, there's a couple of things. When he first invited me, I thought it was just me, me, him and Stephanie and maybe one other person. So when I got there the day before I stayed the night and then we were leaving the next day, I was like, by the way, what time are we leaving in the morning? And Stephanie was like, seven, we got to get up early because we have to go and get everybody else. And I was like, wait, who's everybody else? She was like, oh, my whole family's going on this. Tony didn't tell you? And I was like, no, Tony didn't tell me that. Which, but, <laughs> no, but the thing is, man, is like, to me, that was that was a lot more meaningful than just a regular trip because like, you basically were saying, Luke, you're like family, come with us. I want you to meet the rest of the family. And I really took that part to heart because like, you don't have to invite people on family vacations, you know, and you the fact that I was invited <clears throat> was awesome. Anyway, so there's that. Anyway, we're, we're leaving and we're driving through uh, Middleburg and Schaharie, whatever. And we're going through and I'm looking around and I'm like, and it reminded me of the opening scene from My Cousin Vinny when they're driving through Alabama and they see free dirt, manure for sale, firewood and all this stuff. And I'm looking around and I just looked at him and I was like, Tone. I go, where the heck do all you hicks out here get your gas and stuff anyway? I'm like, I'm like, there's like nothing around for miles. So I start, we started laughing. I go, dude, imagine a TV show. I was like, kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies, but not really like more backwards than that. I was like about a, like a family called the Hickmans. I'm like, and then there could be like a crazy uncle and his name is Hick. Like his, they call him Hick. His name is Hickory, but they call him Hick for short. So his name is Hick yeah. Hickman. And we start going and I started coming up with these different scenarios and we're laughing, you know, so we start driving. We forget about it. So a couple of days after we got back from the trip, he messaged me and he goes, hey, bro, he goes, you remember what we were laughing and talking about, about the Backwoods family on the way to Atlantic City? And I go, yeah, the Hickman's thing. And he was like, yeah, he goes, dude, what would you think about actually putting something together and developing something for that? And I was like. Yeah, I was like, I don't see why not. And I was just like, what'd you have in mind? So we got together, we talked about it. And then we just started kind of coming up with characters and stuff. And just a few weeks ago, we met for the first time to start actually writing the script and all that stuff. And then we just were, was it last Saturday, Tony, that we got yeah. together for a little while? We got together again last Saturday. So we've had two writing sessions so far. So I think one, maybe two more. And we'll pretty much have everything put together. And then I'm going to be sending the script out to all the actors and actresses because I want their input. You know, me and Tony, uh, we already talked about this, that we want the characters to feel completely comfortable. And they're the people playing the characters. We want them to be comfortable in the roles, you know? So it's like, yeah. if they see something that they might not like, or they think, hey, I'm, I think my character would do this instead. I'm like, tell us. I was like, because we'll use it. If it's a better idea than what we have, then I want to use it. You know, I'm not a control freak like that. I just want to get the best product possible to put out there. But yeah, that's what we're working on now. It's called the Hickman's. Uh, going to be a lot of fun. And then after is that, I just uh, met... say again. Is it a comedy or genre? Yeah, it is. It's a comedy. It's a uh, it's a comedy, but it's not tongue in cheek. It's not like really slapstick. It's not like Three Stooges comedy. It's the comedy is in the dialogue. A lot of the kind there's a couple funny things that we wrote into it just for you know a quick pop but a lot of the comedy is in the dialogue you know it's like they say words wrong they don't use them correctly they extend words for no reason like and they just say things that don't make sense but you know what they're trying to say <laughs> so just as an example there's a scene that we were talking about where uh scuba shout outs to scuba scuba's character <laughs> hit <clears throat> scuba's character is tick he plays the crazy cousin and there's a scene when he decides to wake his uncle Cletus. He calls him Uncle Clit, but his name is Uncle Cletus. And he decides to wake him up with firecrackers. We all and, have crazy, dysfunctional people mm -hmm. in our family. So uh, how did you come up with the title, Tony and Luca? We just kind of did, honestly. Yeah. You know, it just, I just said it. I was like, you know, imagine a backwards family named the Hickmans. So I was like, oh, man, it would be funny. Yeah, but what, I, what, I, what, I, what I was going to say was there, during that scene when Scuba wakes Uncle Cletus up with the firecrackers, when he goes back, he lands on a shovel, which hits Scuba right in his uh, you know G spot. <laughs> and so he goes down and then 
Cletus stands up, and 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 you, and you know what he you know what he's trying to say, but he says it completely wrong, and he says, "See that there, kid? That's what we call instant karma sutra around these parts. <laughs> like instead of instant karma, you know what he's trying to say, but he does not know the verbiage at all or anything like that. So yeah, it's well, that kind of that kind of life. <laughs> and remember uh, the women won the battle of the sexes this year, and that's why uh, I, we Teflon and I no longer talk. Because um, we won. Um. <laughs> yeah, I don't even want to get started on that guy. Seriously, man. Like he. No. Yeah. <laughs> but um, tell me about. Are you casting more characters? <clears throat> you have some cast. Who are the characters? Uh, what's the audition process? Where Where are you at with that, Tony and Luca? Go yeah, ahead, I can. Me. I can run that. Um. So it's actually really awesome. The characters uh, we wrote about, and we have ninety percent of them. We already have booked. Um, just because while we're writing the characters out, we're like, oh, you know who will play this role really good? Uh, for instance, uh, Stephanie's dad will play a great Uncle Cletus. Um, he just kind of has that attitude and the the kind of persona he puts off. It's gonna be perfect. Uh, Scuba is playing Heck because when we were writing his character out, we're like, oh, we know exactly who could play this. So they the characters or the people who are playing these characters actually almost wrote it out itself. So it, it worked really well. I think we're missing just two people um, for the kids right now. So yes. yeah, if you know any uh, Asians or I don't know, what, what were you going to say? A white kid and Asian? They're twins, but they're going to be complete. They're twins, honest. right? Yeah. 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 So we're going to have like one white kid and one Asian kid or something like that, you know? Um, so how old um, are the kids that you're casting? Uh, how um, old do they have to be? So this this role we're looking at, um, what would we say about six to ten? So I say between, between six and eight. I don't want to go much above that simply yeah. because I don't want them. I, they need to look like they're the same age. Yeah. So, do the but, kids have to <laughs> parents? Do they have to sign a waiver or a likeness contract? Do you have that going too? Yeah, probably before we actually get everything started, we will have everybody sign a release form. Um, just just for you know, it's always good to do that when you're doing this type of stuff, <clears throat> especially when you're working with people who um, who have experience with this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like it's important that you all you follow the process, you follow the procedure, you do what you got to do. Um, but yeah, like Tony said, we only have two more two more characters that we got to cast and. Uh, as we were writing everything out, I think when we were coming up with the character development, it, it was easy because we all knew we both knew people where it's like this would be awesome. And one of the great parts about it is for the husband and wife, which is Cletus and Maud, uh, it's going to be Tony's uh, father and mother in law that are playing these parts because just their dynamic. Like I was watching them <laughs> one night at the clubhouse and they're going back and forth. And I'm like, and I went to Tony. I was like, dude, let me ask you a question. Do you think that they would play these parts? Because they're already husband and wife. You just have to turn the camera on and let them go. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the dynamic was exactly what I wanted. Ray uh, Ray is a little bit uh, slimmer than I imagine Cletus would be. But it still works just because he's got that same kind of energy to him. And also, I love the guy. He's funny as hell. You can tell him I said that. I think he's hysterical. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of scenes are you doing? Like I was driving, I was so stressed the other day. It could have been a made for TV movie. And um, I was driving and uh, I'm, I have a clean driver's record. So they can't say us women drivers, but I took out my passenger car door. It could have been a made for TV scene. I wish somebody at a camera we could have had a fender bender breakup scene right there because my passenger car door mirror shattered as i was driving and glass everywhere what kind of scenes what kind of staging what kind of setup can you paint the picture can you give some of that away some of that dirt for your script yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. I, I think Tony would be in agreement with this. I'm not speaking for you, but I don't want to give too much away because we haven't even had the opportunity to premiere it or anything yet. But um, I don't know. I'll tell. I'll tell one little thing, and then Tony. I don't know if you want to tell one or two little things. Just but a little there's, there's one little tiny thing that I will tell you is um, 
it's it's really based around i'm not going to tell you how it happens or why it happens but they get a flat tire and just one little thing just so you get an idea of the type of laughs that we're looking for from this <clears throat> is when they're looking for the when they're trying to find a spare one of the guys goes back i, I don't know if we're going to have uh brandon's character do this or, or cletus i don't know who yet <laughs> But when he opens the trunk to look for a spare, there's going to be a random goat in the trunk. And he's just going to say, oh, hey, Charlie. And then he's going to kind of just push him out of the way. Like, it's like totally normal to them that they have just a goat chilling in the back of their car. So, like little, awesome. like, like, little things like that. Like, it's not things you don't expect to see. Like, who's going to have a goat in their trunk? You don't, you don't see that coming. And all of a sudden, you open the trunk, and there's just a goat <laughs> just chilling in the trunk. And you're just like, oh, hey, Charlie, excuse me. <laughs> like, it's totally normal to them. So anyway, that's my yeah. take. Go ahead. Don't. Yeah, um, actually, within that same scene, uh, one of the ones I like, and we have the place for filming and everything, um, they're going to be broken down uh, with the flat tire, and they're trying to find this tire. And their other uncle, um, who is played by my, my president's, uh, my president, he's playing here, and he looks very similar to us, very redneck. And so he's going to roll up on a tractor with a little trailer on the back, like a little lawn trailer with a big old tractor tr tractor tire, uh, tractor trailer tire, uh, and be like, oh, will this work? No? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to go up to the mo lawnmower races now and just, you know, just real quick kind of small, funny stuff. Um, and it is, it's going to be, like Luke said, it's going to be in the dialect. It's going to be things that I'd say normal people would be like, oh, that's – you know, that's that's silly. Why would they, you know, like it's totally normal to them because for that family, it is um, like out here where I live. It's very normal to hear gunshots all day long because they're targeting, you know, they're practicing or whatever. Where if you're in the city. And roosters. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we actually had 20 chickens, but they all got murdered. So, um, but yeah, like we have a uh, bear. Buy, in our buy, buy a bear. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so it's it's going to be like that real good, funny comedy that's authentic and genuine that people are just going to be like, what? Do people actually live like this? And the answer is we're exaggerating it. But, yes, that life does work. Um, a lot of roads up by my house right now are cut off because they're seasonal roads. They don't plow them. So if you don't know where you're going, you're, you're trapped pretty much. So, yeah, it's going to be good. And like I said, the scenes, just those couple scenes with the flat tire is going to be amazing. Um, just the whole lead up to it is going to be a great time. So it's going to be good. It's going to be funny from the opening scene all the way to the end. I So I'm presuming that most of your scenes are going to be on location. Uh, as you know, I've filmed in studios before and we were with some major stars like Sarah Jess and Ryan Gosling. And uh, is, are you doing on location or are you going to do some green screen work how's that going to work um i think we might do some green screen for maybe like the opening i'm not going to tell you how it opens tony knows what i'm talking about i don't know that we'll actually need a green screen for that but it's a possibility but the majority of it if not all of it will be shot um how how long is that stretch oh probably half a mile maybe comfortably half mile yeah oh yeah about a half a mile space this is the whole thing's going to be recorded because everything we need when we went to scout locations this was probably what about four or five months ago tony when we did that something like that yeah. when we went around to see the different locations the first one that tony took me to i was like this is perfect and the guy said that we could use some of his farm animals for for some of the scenes and that's how i got the idea of having the goat in the trunk and i was like dude what, what wouldn't this be funny if we did this one scene like for some reason, I don't know why that one little thing stands out to me in the whole script. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when they're just because like you don't see that type of thing, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's totally normal with these people. So yeah, it's gonna be great. Yeah, how nah, works like A production will it take. I've been on. I've been in movies where it's been a couple of weeks, and then I've been in movies with a couple of months. Uh, do you have a shot script? Uh, do you have a layout of how many time, how many days of production, and then what happens in post production? Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty much. I would assume uh, probably only two, three times we'll have to shoot everything. Um, in sense of like actual, because it's not going to be a long, long. It's more of a pilot. Um, maybe 10, 15 minutes long. But I think ninety percent of it will be done probably within the first day. Um. Because like you were saying, Luke, that beginning shot is going to be somewhere different. 
but I think 9% of it can be done maybe in two, three days at most. Yeah. I think um, one, one of the things is, for for such a short thing you have to get your point across quick you know what i mean like these short films like you really have to and so like i thought of a way of how to get all the characters across in a efficient and timely manner which is the opening scene uh the whole thing is kind of done from scuba's character's perspective and <laughs> i told i told tony i was like i think what we should do is we'll do you know a few takes we'll get what we have written we'll get what we we want but then do it i was like i say we turn the camera on and let him go just to, and, because you might, you could get gold from improv, you know what I mean? Absolutely. It could be, and like the, like the cut, like Jim Carrey movies, his first ones back in the day, the Ace Ventura's Dumb and Dumber. So much of those films people don't realize was not scripted. The things you see on screen, like the part when Jim Carrey says, Hey, you want to hear the most annoying sounds in the world? And he starts yelling. You see Jeff Daniels physically start to laugh because it wasn't scripted. He just did it. So, and that's the type of stuff that humor that I want is like, I could, just want to turn the camera on and let Scuba, Ray, and Tina just all just go. Like those three, especially because when they're interacting together, I think it's going to be hilarious. Absolutely. But I also, I also don't want to be Stanley Kubrick in the sense where you do 180 takes to the point where the actors are physically exhausted <laughs> and get upset with you. Um, but that guy was relentless with the way he filmed. However, if you watch a Kubrick film, everything is so pinpointed and finely done that like there's if it's in his film he wanted it there so like a lot of people say like i don't mean to go off on a tangent but the film the shining how there's a lot of continuity errors but there's so many that i realized one day i'm like he did this on purpose to create an unsettling atmosphere and i looked into it and i found out that i was right because there's scenes that don't make sense the layout of the hotel doesn't make sense and they shot so many takes of for for different things, and that's why uh, Shelley Duvall ended up having like post traumatic stress from from filming that movie. I don't want to be like that. I want to do you know four or five takes of each thing, and then just turn the camera on and say, "Go ahead, guys, just do do your thing, talk, have fun," <laughs> you know. So, but yeah, I'd say probably probably three or four days worth of shooting, probably do it a couple weekends. Very cool. Love the hat, by the way. I, I've seen it before. I'm going to see it again, Luca. And uh, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I love your hair, bro. I love your hair. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And uh, again, I do appreciate you serving the country <laughs> and um, wanted to get some words of advice for our audience because I have a little bit of my mental health issues and post-traumatic stress going on from the last five years mm -hmm. of whatever has happened in the government. We don't want to get into corruption on this show, but <laughs> uh, give me some words of advice for people struggling um, with depression or trauma or just feeling sorry for themselves because all normally you can feel sorry for yourself but give me some words of advice being in combat and training and afghanistan and all of that training stuff that you had in the army you're a little bit more in tune with the worldly advice and i'd like mm -hmm. to hear that from you before we wrap yeah i mean the worst thing that anyone can say is, oh, you'll be okay. You'll be all right. That's the worst thing I've learned people say. Oh, it's it's just a phase. You'll get over it. I say embrace that suck. Embrace what you're feeling because what you're feeling is real for you. You know, it may not be real for me, but it's real for that person. It may be real for Luke, it may be real for you, but it may not be real for me. So embrace what you're feeling as a person. Take that negative energy you're feeling and try to – it's hard to do, but try to turn it to a positive, which again is very difficult. But one thing that always kept me kind of my, um, my why find out what your why is, but I've always learned there's someone you matter to somebody somewhere in the world. It may not be today, tomorrow, right now. You may not think that because it's hard to, when you're in a depressive state or you're very upset, I understand that. So you matter to somebody somewhere in the world. So if you want to let yourself down, that's fine, but don't let them down because whatever you do is going to ripple effect and affect other people. 
And if something were to happen to Luke today, I would be distraught. I would be totally off my rocker. Um, and I know it'd be vice versa. Same thing with Stephanie and, you know, my kids, if something happened to them. So I have to remember when I'm going through my bout, my bouts of depression or, or, you know, it's been, you know, a certain time period of the year or a certain date, you know, I have a lot of uh, kind of triggers with that stuff. I've learned you're still here. You can still do good things. You have to fight for your why, fight for that person in your life that matters, whether it's a parent, whether it's a sibling, a child, a spouse, a uh, best friend, partner, whatever, you know, like I say, I look at it as it's not you. You can feel sorry for yourself. That sucks. But the thing is you have to get through it for someone else because you matter to someone else more than you matter to yourself at that point. So you got to think about the bigger picture because I didn't realize how many people like back in the day um, when I was in the army, when I tried committing suicide, when I was getting out and stuff, I was really upset because I had a whole, I had this whole life plan. Okay. I'm going military career. 20 years, this, that, and the other. So when I blew my knee out, I was like, well, now what do I do? Um, and I went through a lot of bad depression stuff. And um, when I w tried to kill myself, I realized afterwards, after I started getting my mental health better, how many people I actually affected and how many people really were affected in a negative way where they're like, holy crap, you can't do it again. We need you here in life. Um, so yeah, just think about like the other people in your life, not yourself. Be Don't be selfish. Think about the Very other good people. Point. And you said a lot of good can come out of trauma. Luca, Absolutely. you're you're my trainer, you're my personal trainer to my body. And I haven't taken people have asked me to take a Xanax to get over my sister's death. And I chose to deal with my pain from my beautiful, gorgeous sister's death, who was an attorney in New York State, with hiking mountains and painting and taking care of my body and eating right and working. Luca, what would you say to people who are struggling with trauma as a personal trainer? You, What would you tell me if I were to go back and do it over again, uh, mourn the, my sister's death five years ago and s would you recommend that special blue pill in the form of a xanax do you diet what do you recommend for people taking care of their mental and physical health uh the well, number one thing i could say is read my book <laughs> i'm going to say that again because <clears throat> as i was writing that book i had to address a lot of things within myself and things that I have already thought about, but you know, maybe not, didn't think about them quite enough. And so as I was writing my book, I had to revisit some things that you really don't want to revisit. There's things that happen that you don't want to go back to, but read my book, that's number one, okay? Number two, you have to find something to channel the energy into a positive way, okay? That's how I started writing music was because as a lot of people know, I was a professional wrestler back in the day from 13 to right before I turned 19. and that was my entire life for that time period. And there was nothing else that mattered to me other than working out and wrestling. That was it. I didn't care about anything else. And when that suddenly was gone and it wasn't like a build up and it kind of faded away after a time, one day it was there and the next day it wasn't anymore. And it was, it was such a quick change. I was, you know, not to say anything. I was pissed. <laughs> okay. I, I was not a happy person when I was 18. And then all of a sudden, one day, I just kind of started writing music. And then I started noticing how much I was channeling into that. And then I met my producer. And then I met, you know, other artists that I started collaborating with. And then I started doing shows. And then I started coming out with albums and mixtapes. And then I met Tony. And then I went to L.A. And then I went to Atlanta. You never know where that path is going to take you. So find a path to channel the energy into that's positive. And even if it's not completely positive okay where it's like some people get into martial arts and mma fighting and they get and they start just taking aggression out on other people but in a legal way <laughs> okay so even though that might be violent it's still channeling it into something that is actually useful to yourself okay Absolutely. and find things that you want to do like just find you have to have the mindset okay find something that you love and find something you want to do don't be afraid to try new things okay because you might find something you love. Just as a quick little example, 
uh, Keanu Reeves, okay? Not that he was depressed, but just as an example of what I mean. If you've seen the movie Point Break, okay, the movie about the surfers, Patrick Swayze was the lead and Keanu Reeves was the lead. And they had to learn how to surf to do those roles. Keanu Reeves learned how to surf for that role. I talk about this in my book. He learned how to surf and still surfs to this day. It's one of his favorite things in the world and he didn't even know until he tried it for a film. And then now he does it still to this day. He fell in love with it. So you never know if you try something, you may love it. You have no idea. It's like Tony and I, the neck, we're already talking about our next thing after the Hickmans. I talked to him earlier today. I was like, hey, bro, um, you know, he brought something to me. It's kind of like lots of times I'll come up with an idea and not think anything of it. And then a couple of days later, Tony, but hey, bro, you remember that idea you had? What if what if we tried this? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> lots of times I'll come up with something and think nothing of it. And Tony will see some kind of genius in it and be like, bro, no, I, we should go with this. So the next thing we're going to be doing is hopefully starting to work together to talk about the dating world. <laughs> OK, and give some advice where we have a little bit different view on that. Some of our concepts and ideas mesh very well but he's still willing to do things I'm not willing to do anymore. And I'm willing to do things that he's maybe not so much willing to do anymore. So we have opposite opinions, but some of the same opinions. But like I said, find those things that you want to invest your time into that's going to create some kind of positive outcome, or at least has the potential to create a positive outcome for yourself. Would you say wrestling uh, set the stage for your the, your the rest of your entire life on how to be disciplined and start your own company and and become a model and a and uh, a business owner? Absolutely. That's actually again. I talk about that in my book. I talk about that right at the beginning. Was the first time I ever got into the ring, and something happened at that moment when I got in the ring and wrestling prepared me for the real world, how people actually are. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how some people are willing to do things that I could never imagine doing to other people. It created integrity. <laughs> it created discipline. Okay. Because I knew I had to be a certain way if I was going to get involved with, with what went, what went on in the ring mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it created something inside me. I was never going to quit no matter what I might change paths. <laughs> I, I might, I might go into a completely different thing. Like when I was 17, if you told me that when I was 20, I was going to be in the studio recording music, I'd have called you a liar. I'd be like, no, man, I'm going to be in the ring doing my thing. What are you talking about? But three years later, I was in the studio recording music, talking about things that I experienced in the ring, <laughs> you know? So again, you never know where it's going to take you. And yes, to answer your question simply, Wrestling set the stage for everything. It got me comfortable in front of an audience, in front of a camera, got me in tune with my body and my physique and being athletic. And here I am today, you know, so. <laughs> it, it's definitely important to have my, my body and mind in check. And sometimes the rest of our audience might not know how to balance out life. If someone were wanting to get a hold of you, Luca, how would they get your book and how would they reach you for training? Well, for to find my book, all you have to do is go to Amazon. OK, it's 20 reasons and 20 ways to diminish self-doubt. Uh, or you can visit the uh, little uh, Facebook page I created for, which is slash 20 reasons and 20 ways. You can find it there. There's links that go to the Amazon page. Um, and then to find me online for training, you can visit my website. It's pow-fitness.com. Again, it's pow-fitness.com. Or you can visit my other website, lucabrasi.com. That's my music and my book is on there and a whole bunch of other stuff. Or you can find me on social media. It's all slash Brasi Luca, whether it's SoundCloud, Twitter, or Facebook, whatever, Reverb Nation slash uh, Luca Brasi. The only one that's different is Instagram because Luca Brasi, for some reason, was already taken. So it's slash Brasi Luca. So it's Instagram slash Brasi Luca or all the other social media slash Luca Brasi. You can find me uh, or you can email me, Luca Brasi85 at gmail.com. Uh, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. And Tony, when do yeah. we hear your podcasts and where do we hear them? Yeah, you can find it on every platform. I am on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, um, Anchor, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, NPA, NPR. Um, any place you, you listen to podcasts, I am on there. Um, and it's simply uh, click in the search button, uh, Triggered the Podcast. And it's a little black and gold 
little microphone you'll see. Um, there's another company that does a podcast called Triggered, and they're kind of like a comedic thing. Um, so I had to kind of reword it and rebrand it. So just Triggered the podcast. Um, and you can hear, you know, check us out on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Same thing, Triggered the podcast. Again, Anchor and Spotify um, for listening to it. And I put shows out. I haven't put one out in a little while because I've been doing so much other work. Me and Luke have been really busy. Um, but usually I put them out once every couple weeks. Um, or if something's just really heavy on my chest, I just hop on 7, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just a quick little here you go. Um, I also have it on the YouTube. Same thing, triggered the podcast, and that is on StreamYard. So you can see the actual vis- visual and audio. Uh, but if you just want to listen to it, if you're in the car, any of those podcast sites will work. Same, triggered the podcast. Yes, and we definitely appreciate both of your insights and your time. Uh, I know you're so crazy busy. I know you told me, and I begged and I begged (laughs) to get you on um, this new community show, Now or Never. Uh, We could call it community kindness for all I care, just to touch the public and reach out and try to help people that are not necessarily wanting to voice that they're going through depression or mental health or thinking about suicide. So this is very important and I appreciate both of your time. Any last words, anything we haven't covered before I bring on always? Tony, go ahead, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I was say, you know, stay triggered, um, smile, life does get better. Uh, again, there was a point where I was in a really bad spot and my life is wonderful. Now I feel very blessed and keep positive people around you. If if you have someone that's a a leech or negative and you're always around them and they're, or they're around you and you just feel negative afterwards, get rid of them. You don't need it. Stay positive, put positive people in your life. Agreed. (laughs) And Luca, any last words? Pow. (laughs) <laughs> that's it for me I, think, I, know I, think, wealth. It, I know that by hanging yeah. around with luca has trained my my mind body and soul i encourage everyone to get their bodies in check not just their physical bodies but their minds and i appreciate everyone's time today we have always carrie coming up in a little while uh, next in the lineup It's a special memorial today. We're praying wholeheartedly for the Humphrey family. It's just the media has given them a really hard time and they're feeling it. And so uh, I'm just reaching out to tell everybody that just be kind. You never know what anybody is going through. It's, it's not a good story that there's a 14 year old that was found in a river in New York state. We have certainly have compassion for that and God bless everybody. Thank you so much, Luca and Tony. We'll look for the Hickmans and we're so excited. And if you ever want to come back and just give me a play by play about production, or you want me to cover some of that and get get it in the media, uh, definitely we can do this again. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be, well, yeah, we'll be in touch. You already know. Thank you, Kim, so much. Tony, thank you, brother. And I'll see you. Uh, when do we see each other again? Uh, 25th? 25th, yeah. All right, cool. All right, all right, Kim. Your lovely wife, Tony. I will, thank you. And God bless, and thank you so much for your time. Be safe. Thank you. Wow. Wow.